I'm going to read from the last story of the book. It's called Time Travel. 21 years later, I'll run into you outside the path station in Hoboken, in front of the wide green awning that leads down to the trains. Sounds of rumbling below and the din of chatter swirling. You'll yell my name above the noise, saying it like a question, as if you could actually be unsure that it's me. I'll turn and totter on the top step, just in time. Seconds later, and I'd be swept into the stream of bodies flowing to the tracks. It'll be shortly after 5 p.m. on a late September weekday, humid and sunny, with air that smells of commuters caught in unexpected high heat. Perspiration will roll down my back and leak between the butt cheeks you used to make fun of. I'll squint against the sun and stare at you. You'll smile with closed lips and brown eyes that will be gentler than I remember. Several seconds will pass before you'll say, wow, first time I've ever seen you away from home. Where are you living these days? Manhattan, I'll say. Oh, the big city, you'll say, like it's a truly good thing. I won't ask you anything. I'll look at you and wait. Suits of blue, black, gray, and tan will dodge and whoosh past us, heels clicking on concrete, huffs and impatient scoffs. We'll be in the way. I'll shield my eyes with one hand and be silent for so long, it will feel impolite. You'll hold a cheap, gray suit jacket over one shoulder, your white collared shirt bearing sweat marks under the arms. You'll smell of obsession for men, alluring and more sophisticated than the old spice I used to notice at the bus stop during high school when you rarely spoke to me. Your chest will be broad and you'll be slim like me, which will mean something because 21 years earlier, we were chubby six-year-olds foraging together for ding-dongs and Oreos my mother hid deep in the pantry so we wouldn't overeat. We'd find them and eat them all. And that thrill was a bond we shared. But being connoisseurs of Nabisco cookies and hostess snack cakes and being buddies from the time we could crawl, never made our bond as strong as the one you shared with every kid in the neighborhood but me. Someone will bump into you and you'll fall into me and grab my arm before I lose my balance on the top step. Sorry, you all right? You'll ask. I'll say, fine, thanks, and take my arm back. That day, 21 years after I lost you, I'll be wearing a tomato red kufi, atop unapologetically kinky hair, wild kinks I tamed the soul out of when I lived across the street from you, hoping straight hair would make me pretty and more like everyone else. But you called me an ugly, bubble-butted nigger at the bus stop. Elementary school became junior high, which turned into high school, and I barely existed. You had all those years to speak to me. That day, I'll wonder, why now? I'll have on black, chunky boots and a dress that's lime green like Lifesavers candies. Red, black, and green are Pan-African colors, and I'll wear them because at the time, I'll be mad and militant saying, fuck you to you and everyone else from home who said my color, my hair, and my big butt made me ugly. That day at the path station, it won't matter to me that you were only a boy when you said those things. I won't smile. I won't be warm. I'll forget any mean things I may have said back at the bus stop. I probably said some because I will remember how you winced at the mention of your fat mom, crippled father, and port wine-stained birthmarked baby sister. 
my tongue sharpened on figurative and literal sticks and stones hurled at me by neighborhood bullies must have pierced your soft spots sometimes too. Yet you'll look at me that day with a tenderness that insists cruel words never pass between us. Your dark hair will be short, your skin clean shaven, clear, the spots of adolescence healed and faded. Your face will flush and your eyes will brighten the way they used to shine when you were my round cheeked running buddy. You'll look deep into me with such warmth that against my will, you'll begin to melt the icicles that numbed me inside. My name, when you say it, will sound like songs from playtime's past. In your eyes, I'll catch a glimpse of us singing on swings, flying above the grass where we found four leaf clovers. You'll invite me into a little chamber of your heart where you saved us, but I won't go. I won't be ready to remember how to get there. There will be no mention of what happened to us or what didn't happen that should have. You'll sing my name again. A young boy's sweetness shining out of your grown man's face. And you'll say, you were my first best friend. I'll know you're telling me you're sorry. You didn't mean to hurt me, you were just a kid. I'll nod politely and shrug off your words of apology. I'll carry my bubble butt and my baggage down the stairs, catch my train, and move on with my life. In another 21 years, I'll be middle-aged and softer inside and out. I'll remember how you said my name that day and the way you looked at me with affection. I'll transport myself back to the path station in front of the trains Trains rumbling below, bodies whooshing by, and I'll be kinder to you. I will, because by then I'll know that love is the only feeling left once enough time has passed. Thank you. It was amazing. I'm a little emotional. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for I first met Tony Ann uh, in Los Angeles about nine years ago at another event ah. like this, and she was reading, and I was in the audience, and I was just kind of like awestruck because that that you, long? <laughs> yes, I think it was 2014. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, uh, wow, like such beautiful words, but also so elegantly performed. And thank you. It, it, and you're still doing that. And I just like, <laughs> Thank I you. love it. Um, I have so much to say, or I want you to say so much. Okay. That I don't even know where to begin, but we can start with this short story and uh, about Tobias, because it's the only of one of the short stories here, I think, that's written in first person. And this is called Autobiographical Fiction. Mm -hmm. And you've chosen to mostly put it in third person, or some mm -hmm. second person and some different perspectives. Can you... Talk about that and how you found these voices and how you chose which, how you wanted to tell each specific story. Yeah, they changed over time. Um, so the original iteration of the collection started in 2006 or seven when I was in graduate school. And some of the stories were in first person. And after people read them and I had edits and stuff, um, when an agent had me change several of them to third person. This story was always in this form. Um, and the one you're thinking about the second person that that's kind of a, a link with it's this story. Point. That's right. that was always in second person. But most of the Maddie stories um, make a space and uh, light skin gone to waste the story. Mm -hmm. 
were in first person and I was encouraged to change them and I didn't mind the change. So I was open to that. Um, and the voices, I, I kind of tried to keep some of the first person texture and tone, even in third person. Yes, so very you kind close. of could yeah. feel what that Your person Maddie said, how they would speak. Um, so yeah, so I guess that that's how it evolved. And then the other voices, you know, the, there's other people, there's other characters. So some of the stories were, you know, from my, the character based on my father and the character based on my mother and, um, and the character based on my cousin. And those voices were a little harder to find, but a little more fun than my own, yep. than the Maddie, Tony Ann voice. Nice, the Tony Ann voice. Um, talk about how you came to write this book. It is, it is oh. beautiful for those of you who have not read it yet. It is Thank you. eloquent and elegant and graceful, but raw and vulnerable and provocative. And it's very much an emotional roller coaster. I mean, there are periods when I'm just lying there in bed, like traumatized at some points. I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I look forward to that. I want an author to take mm -hmm. me on a ride and I want to it to be unpredictable and I don't I want to not know where we're going to end up and I feel mm -hmm. very much that that was the story how did you come to tell this story how did you come to do it as an autobiographical story versus fictionalizing everything let's say so that, so that we can't recognize well, it is both I mean it, it is every story is based on a real event but within those stories things are fictionalized and and that choice was because I wanted the freedom to invent and play and create the worlds, um, create the voices in a fun way. So, you know, there's characters that these are, these people, the people are based on, but sometimes their voices weren't as fun. And so I played, you know, I played with language, but the, the impetus for writing the first story that came to me, um, which was the, the story that's linked to the story I just read. So the, the second story in the book is called Claiming Tobias. And that was the first story that came to me. And I started writing that. I was inspired because I was, I was a screenwriter on the movie um, Ruby Bridges. I was the screenwriter on the movie Ruby Bridges. And there was an incident on set where the little boy who was playing a white child who had to interact with Ruby had to say, my mother said, I can't play with you because you're a nigger. And the little boy did not want to say it. Um, they tried it and he refused to say the line. And finally the director and the child's mother convinced him that it's just for the movie. It's pretend and Shaz, the, the actress playing Ruby won't, it won't hurt her feelings, it's okay. And so he did it and he said the line. And as soon as they called cut, he flew into her lap, sobbing, and said, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it. And every time I hear that story, I, I want to cry. And it reminded me of my friend. And I never got that apology. Right. And right. other people who called me that never felt Bad about guilty it. about right. it. There was no compunction. So, um, I just started thinking about those kids and and I was about six when the first time the word came up in, in our friendship. And so that brought me to that story. And so then once I had that story, I was, I was in graduate school and I was reading lots of story collections and I was inspired by one by Sherman Alexi, the Lone Ranger and Tonto mm -hmm. fist fight in heaven, which did a similar thing, like, you know, characters tracked over a period of time. And then of course, um, drown mm -hmm. by Juno mm -hmm. Diaz. And, and I thought, Oh, I could do something similar. And so I started with that one story. And then I just built, um, most of the first stories were, were all from my point of view, except right. for the, the, um, slumber party one, which is, was from Susie's, Susie's right. point of view, my cousin, um, but then I just kind of built out from there and, and added, you know, Gertie, the white maid and my mom and that the dad. And there were more stories from my sister's point of view, but those got removed for this version. This collection. So at what point did these go from being stories randomly to, oh, I could compile this and make it a book? 
Well, the first, so when I was in graduate school, my, my final manuscript to complete that program was the first draft of this. So it, it, it was a book pretty early on. I finished that program in 2008 and I had this book, it, it had this title, but then when I got out of school, I joined a writing group and I got a really harsh critique on one of the stories yeah. and I <laughs> shut down and I didn't write for a while. I didn't write at all. But then when I started writing again, I went back to um, a novel that I had started that didn't sell. And I rewrote that and then got that published. And then right around the time when that got published, I started getting these stories um, published. And then uh, an agent became involved and she she told me to add multiple other points of view and, and more stories. And so it went from there. Um, but from the first iteration, say like 2007 to when it got published as a book was like 15 years. So it's wow. quite a long period of time. Yes, <laughs> I understand that <laughs> process. Yes, um, don't feel bad. <laughs> no. <laughs> because this story, and I'm still upset about your friend. <laughs> I'm set. Um, because the story is autobiographical and it features your family and not always in, in a pretty light, mm -hmm. how was it received by them? How did you feel writing it, knowing that they were going to read it and it was going to be out there? Oh. And <laughs> you can express as much as you want or or not. Um, well, my father is deceased and he most likely would have hated the book, um, but, but I'm not sure. He might have just hated the parts about him. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know. But when I was younger in the 80s, I was writing plays and I did I did a play at the Negro Ensemble Company and two of the story, um, actually all of the my pieces in that play were about my father and he, hate, he was like, nah, 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 nah. he just hated it so much. Um, but it was easier to do it once my dad died. Um, my mom and I don't speak, but I am told she really doesn't like the book, which I would have expected, but I told her not to read it. So it's on her. Right. <laughs> was it cathartic writing these stories or did it dig up a lot of yeah. unsettled feelings? and? You know, I think what it did was help me look at my parents' point of view mm -hmm. more deeply mm -hmm. and consider things that I hadn't really considered. And so I think even though they would hate the book, I think that I had more compassion for them once I wrote the book than before I wrote the book. Right. Um, and so that that was a good experience. I mean, some of it was really hard because I was revisiting memories that were really painful, but I guess not surprisingly, once I finished, I kind of felt like, ha, oh, and I felt like I had just sort of gotten it out, gotten it down. Because what, one of the stories that, that involves um, an assault, I had hardly told anybody about that. Right. And so to share that publicly, I, I told somebody, it feels like I'm like streaking in, like, right. in public or something. But, but now that I've done it, like, what else is there? Like, I, I have no fear because right. you own it's that out moment. there. It's right. like, I've revealed that. And I, I guess I feel lighter. And what was your mom's response to that? We've discussed this before, but if you, if you are comfortable sharing about that, about, about that about particular that specific, incident, yeah, because that yeah, is no very empathy. hard to read as, as a mother. Please. So I, during the process of the edit, Roxanne Gay, who was my editor, did not believe that um, this child's parents would leave her with a babysitter, a male babysitter in a foreign country, which they did. <laughs> and so she she said that I had that I could keep that if I wanted to keep the story, but that I had to work harder to persuade a reader that this actually happened. So I had to invent that. And so I called my mother to ask her, well, what was going through your mind when, you know, when you decided to leave me? And she just was very defensive and then sort of threw it back at me. Now I was eight years old at the time. And she said, why didn't you say anything? You should have said something. And so it was kind of like blamed it on me. And I have not spoken to her since then. It was just too much. I, 
it was just sort of a eureka moment like okay if you can't have empathy for me about this i just can't do this i right. just i just right. can't be in conversation with you because yeah. i'm asking you something painful and difficult and i'm really asking earnestly and so it just wasn't well received so that was her response um was that her first time finding out no i she was the first person i told 10 years later um and then i can't remember like everything but much of it was well that was your father's fault <laughs> um but there was you know they were my parents right um, so, yes um yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um okay sorry that's okay <laughs> um I want to talk about uh your process if we mm -hmm. can go into that and your background as an actress and a screenwriter and what skills that gave you like that that you bring to writing fiction yeah I love that we have that yes. in common because, because it, you understand yeah, I so do. I started as an actor and and I studied at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. So I was learning method acting and I tend to use the same approach when I'm writing. So I put my, you know, I become those characters right. and I try to feel my way through them um, as I would if I, if I were an actor. And I feel like what you get in acting training, you understand subtext. And so I'm able to bring that. And also as a screenwriter, mm -hmm. you, you learn that, but I'm able to to find that within scenes. Um, the the craft of visual and dramatic writing is really helpful, even as a fiction writer, because you you can picture the what you're writing. You can picture it visually and sort of give the the whole picture to your reader. Right. Um, and I really appreciate doing that. So I have to credit one of my mentors, who's also my partner, Leonard Chang, with that because in my first novel, when he critiqued it. I was do I was doing things that you know weren't quite visual because I was caught up in the words I wanted the words to be impressive and sound great and he said the reader needs something to visualize right. basically nobody cares like how eloquent right. the words are if they don't if they, if can't, they can't see it if they can't picture it and so that was helpful too so I try to bring you know all those elements in and um definitely both acting and screenwriting I think have helped me with my fiction do you feel there's a freedom in writing fiction versus writing screen writing for the screen? For me, yeah, because when I was writing for the screen, I was a writer for hire right. most of the time. And so I got notes and I had to do what they said. And I also found that it contributed to a loss of confidence working for hire because I just kept feeling undermined by by notes like saying, well, this isn't right. This isn't, you know, just do it this way. And so I would end up writing what sounded like the producers I was working, not, it wasn't my voice. voice. And so when I write my own work, you know, it's my voice. I, I mean, sometimes, you know, an, an editor will make you change something or ask you to go deeper, but they don't typically ask you not to write the way you write. Otherwise, they're not, they wouldn't want your book anyway. But that did happen in screenwriting. And I would think, why, why did you hire me? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, I was going to ask about um, what do you get for yourself from writing fiction that you don't get, let's say, from acting and vice versa? Wow, that's a really interesting question. I find it very satisfying. And I find it all wrapped up in into one so you know I love reading my stories because <laughs> I, nobody is hiring me as an actress but I can come here and read my story to you like the actress that I want to be um so and then I also have done the audiobooks for all for all of my books and so I get to act you know when I do that I just I find it so satisfying but I guess what I get that I didn't get from screenwriting or acting is that it just feels like this is really mine. Whereas, Absolutely. you know, when, when I'm acting, I'm saying somebody else's words or I'm, and I'm following the, the direction of, of the director. And when I'm screenwriting, I mean, I'm, I'm writing, I'm being, I'm doing what I'm told to do. Right. Right. Um, and so with the book, I just feel like this is my opportunity to do 
just what I want to do and to get it, you know, the way that I want it to be. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a sad, it's more satisfying I for me. So I feel like acting is much more of a collaborative endeavor mm -hmm. and you're part of a bigger picture and you just need to do your job and, and, and be done with it. But yeah. I feel like writing is, you know, you're birthing this idea from the beginning. And yeah, I think it so feeds we, the, the artist in us, like in, in a different way, um, because it, it, it is, sort of multi-dimensional it's not just the words on the page it's your emotion it's the way you express yourself it's how you view your characters they're so it's so rich right um I like to think of it as um I feel like acting you're 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 waiting for often you're waiting for permission to yeah. act and writing you can get up and do it any point of time any day any point, yes, whatever and exactly. then you know feel like you've got something to show for it as opposed to waiting for someone to hire you and allow yes. you to do what you love to do that's why I started writing right. I, I was because I was an actor I was trying to do plays but I would show up to auditions and people would say what are you hmm. I didn't look black enough or I did or I was too ethnic I wasn't right for so I started writing right Yep. So were you writing parts for yourself? I wrote a part for myself. Yeah. My first play, there was no part for me, but the next play, after I got tired of just being told you're not right for this or, right. or the horrible direction, well, can you do it blacker? Yeah, uh, I was yeah. like, okay. I get that all the time. <laughs> and I'm much darker than you are. So <laughs> um, I wrote a piece about uh, somebody who looks like me. Right. <laughs> Good. Um, so which brings me to your process. Tell me yeah, what it's like. How do, you, how do you write every day, same time every day, same place? Or do you? Is it... When I'm working on a book, um, on, a, on a draft of something, I typically do write every day. So in the last draft of this, I was writing every day from 11 to 3. And I would sign into this uh, Zoom meeting <laughs> And I would get, you know, we, it was like writing in silence yeah. or writing together. I, I did that so during I, the pandemic. And I found yes. that really helpful, the structure of that. Yeah. Um, I, I do tend to, when I'm working on something, write every day. But, I, but during the pandemic, I was just kind of like not structured and I was thinking I was going to die. So I just was, it was very hard to focus. And that, that Zoom meeting just helped me just, you know, just sign in, do the work and then sign off. And I was done for the day. So that was really good. good. But my typical process, um, I don't always write every day. Like I'm not writing now I'm here. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I do other things. So I don't always write every day, but when I'm trying to finish something, I try to. What do you do to feed you as a, an artist? I read, I travel, I go to museums, I watch movies, um, plays. I just, I just saw the piano lesson uh, on Broadway, the last show. And it was wow. just so, oh, it just fed me so much. August Wilson, just amazing. And it was Sam Jackson directed by his wife, Latanya Jackson. And theater really, um, really excites me. And I, I get a lot from that. Um. That's wonderful. I feel, I feel the same way. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask about um, what about you? you uh, what What do I do? What do, do you do? You like to see plays, or like what do you? I do? moved to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I can find inspiration anywhere, and I can also kind of shut down and not and feel like I I'm not I'm not finding it. I'm not finding it, and so I have mm. to kind of allow myself to get out of my own way um travel is a big thing for me uh art museums books reading mm -hmm. uh I, I don't know if you ever did this in acting class but there's this this exercise we do called the uh, the picture exercise I think I have you you put your you become the you character. become a character mm -hmm. and, and you have to go to a museum and find yeah. a piece and like and you can't just go up there and be like oh look I'm a, or like I'm Mona Lisa but like every little thing has to be completely and you're trying to get everything right and mm. I think from doing that exercise I've I kind of loved the idea of putting myself in that painting and mm -hmm. that and, and and then kind of what is it like there and what would have been that time and that place and it, it kind of it opens your your head into the idea of being in other spaces and mm -hmm. um so I kind of, that's one of, one of the things I do. <laughs> and that's very interesting. Yes. Um, can we talk a little bit more about uh, what your, your story about um, 
how this came to be, what you've done before, what mm -hmm. you've put on the back burner and what you're returning to and what you've got coming up next. Oh my God, that was a lot, Rob. I know, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So what was the first thing, What, how this came to be? Right, so you, you talk about your fiction that you had the, how? before, right. You're, oh, saying okay. you're writing short stories when you were writing the fiction piece at the same time when you when you first started this. So that was um, so the first novel was Remedy for a Broken Angel, um, where that's where we met at, when I was reading yes. from that book. Um, so that I had I had written while I was still screenwriting, and I just had the audacity to think I could write a novel, and I ended up getting a New York book agent for the book, but it didn't sell, and then I realized I don't know how to write a novel like I didn't really know what I was doing I know that feeling um, so I decided okay well it didn't sell it must be bad I need I need to go back to school and I was very excited to go back into a program where I would just be immersed in fiction so I was reading a lot and and writing and learning how to write short stories that's why the short stories in this book um have all different voices because i was in school when i started right, right. you know so i was like oh i can write in second person oh let me try that you know just trying all different things um but when i finished that program i got out um and i rewrote the book with a, you know a little more sophistication right. and I, and I finally I didn't sell it to a, a large press I I got frustrated with the whole age trying to find an agent and I just sold it to a small press right. but it was it was fine um I got some recognition from it and so it was it, that was a good experience um and then I was doing this that then that you know that was directly following that and then now what I'm working on is a novel based on Remember, I said I, I wrote this part for somebody who looks like me. So I wrote this play called Gramercy Park is Closed to the Public. And that play launched my career. So that was how I got my screenwriting agent, who was Dave Wordshafter. This was way back in the 90s. The one was this? Okay. And, yeah. And so and that living in New York at that time. I'm guessing. No, I was I, oh, you I was in L.A., okay. um, but I, I got signed to this big agency and I just started getting jobs, just right. started writing for hire. I wrote, I got into Sundance to the screenwriters lab mm -hmm. and I did an adaptation of that, mm -hmm. um, that there was an offer, but my agent encouraged me to pass on the offer because at the time I was still young and I wanted to play the role. Right. Um, but that didn't, that never happened. And so the, the, the screenplay just sort of sat idle for, for right. years. So within the last few years, I, while I was waiting for notes from my agent, while I was working on this book. I started doing an adaptation, what I what was going to be like a novelization sort of of that screenplay, but a novelization isn't really what I do. So it just got deeper and deeper. So I, I used the spine of the screenplay as the structure for this novel, but then I went much deeper into everybody and more backstories and um more complications right. but I, but i always knew where i was writing to because i i knew what the end of act one was right, end, right. you know i i just i knew where i was going so it was a pleasure because i could go on these diversions but i was like oh this is the this is where i need to get to this is what i'm writing to and so i really like that i don't know if a lot of other people do that but it's so much easier to go from a screenplay to a novel than it is to go from a novel to a screenplay because the screenplay is necessarily so much shorter right, right, than a novel, right. um, but the opposite gives you a lot of freedom and, and a lot of security because you, you know what's going to happen. You know coming. Yeah. Do you um do you typically outline, or are you one of those? Um, I outline screenplays, and I do sort of a um an approximation of an outline for books, but because you know, when you're writing fiction, as you know, there are discoveries, like you're writing something and, that you didn't expect and like, oh, what's this? And you, you know, you go a little bit more in, in another direction right. sometimes. And so outlines for novels, for me, typically change. Right. Um, they, they sort, they're sort of amorphous, but, um, but I do outline screenplays because I worked as a screenwriter for so many years. Like you had to deliver yeah. an outline. It's right. one of the steps. I don't get paid until I deliver an outline. So I have no choice but right. to, to write an outline. Do you, <laughs> do you like, do you write a treatment? Like you've got an, no, because someone's coming to you. Most, most of it was for hire. So they're coming to yeah, you. Yeah. So yeah, they already, there was usually an idea and I would be hired to X. I, I would first often have to pitch my take on what that would, what the idea was. Right. 
um, and I would do that. And then from there, um, I would deliver like a first pass of an outline and right. then do, rewrite it. And then, you know, once the outline was set, then I could go then to script. Go further. Yeah. Do you, are you the kind of, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Um, I can't do like a, a garbage draft and then come back and change. I'm constantly editing, editing, editing okay. as I'm writing. And mm -hmm. it, it trips me up a lot. Um, it worked for one book, but maybe not so much for this book. I want to know yeah. what are you, how, how kind are you to yourself when you're writing? I'm like because you. I, so when I was writing my book, I was rewriting every day. So I would like, I would write a chapter and then read it over and then, and I should have just left it alone. and kept going so I could more quickly get finished with the book. But like you, I would re, I would revise and revise and then move forward. So it took a lot longer but if that's how it works for you, I think it's fine because yeah, you don't want to, some people are fine with a bad first draft right. and they're just like, right. let me just get this down. But if, but, but typically I already kind of know where the story's going. Mm -hmm. So I find it useless to have a bad first draft, especially if I already sort of know what, where, where what the going, beats right. are going to be. Right. And then I feel like, you know, you go back and you edit. I'm going through a process now and go back and I edit one thing, but it's on page 33. And now I've got to go and look at 200 pages following that. Oh. Like, oh, did I mention this here before? Or do I have to change that? And yeah, well, at least you can do a search. <laughs> so yes, you can. Find it. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Not the olden days of my typewriter. Right. <laughs> I, I was writing in high school on a uh -huh. typewriter. And like, my first play was on a typewriter yeah. and, I, and people would ask me to change things and I'd be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> They get the white out. <laughs> you younger generation don't know what white out is, but uh, yeah. yeah. Well, there anything that I haven't brought up that you would like to address? No, I'm good. Let's open it up to questions. Thank you so you much, and thank you to you. Thank you for having you. me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Robin. Thank, thank you. you. Fantastic. Are there any audience questions? Yes. 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 Thank you so much. I'm really intrigued by your um, saying that you use method acting to write your characters. So I'm curious when you're writing antagonists, and especially, you know, I'm going to hope this isn't like if it has a personal relationship, by getting into that character, do you get forgiveness or what happens? That's there? a good question. I, I wouldn't say that I get forgiveness, but I do get more compassion. Um, so I would say the parents in this book are antagonists and I did put myself in their point, point of view. And I, it's hard to forgive a narcissist because they're never sorry. So there's that, but I did have, I did come away with a better understanding of, of their perspectives. So that, that was helpful, but I, th I don't know, like I have been asked so often about the forgiveness. Cause there's a lot of people that could use being forgiven in this book, but I don't think I really forgive people. I think I let go of my anger. I let go of my anger and I just like in the story that I read. So I don't think Maddie forgives Tobias, but she recognizes that there really was something authentic and loving there and she can push her anger aside and reconnect with that and meet him from that place and maybe if that if you wanted to find forgiveness like that okay like but I still I still don't forgive him for calling me the n-word I still think it was wrong and I don't let him off the hook I hold people accountable but but I can see the good in him from when he was a little boy um so I hope that answers your question. Did this, I, I ask from that question in your relationship with your father, mm -hmm. do you feel like you achieved forgiveness in writing this or had you already been pretty much on good terms? Um, when my father passed away, we were on okay terms because my father had dementia and he didn't remember <laughs> that we didn't get along. <laughs> so when oh, I was man. He was so happy to see me, but I think he thought I was like 13. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so we were great. Um, but in writing about my father's relationship with his own mother, I just I had so much compassion because my father told me 
all these things about his mother and how he didn't feel like she loved him. He felt that she rejected him. And so really like putting that down and having like creating that conversation, I did feel for my dad. I, you know, like I, I feel empathy for him and I feel it for my mother too, even though my mother was really mean to me, yeah. but she had a, she had a traumatic childhood as did my father. And I think, you know, childhood trauma creates broken people and if you don't do, if you don't acknowledge that you've gone through a trauma and you're just sort of proceeding through life as if it didn't happen, you don't show up as a full person because you're suppressing this, this thing. Right, and, right. and I think that's what happened to my mother. And I can, I guess I, it's almost forgiveness, but not quite. Cause I'm not talking to her. So maybe, it's, maybe not, not entirely. Another Thank you. Question? Yeah. More questions here. Hello. Hi. Um, my question involves the, uh, the book is, it's such a beautiful like, distillation of characters, you know, like um, you have these um, key moments in this person's life, in these people's lives that, you know, really makes you, makes the reader feel like you, you see the entirety of the person, you know? So I was wondering, how did you choose those moments to um, highlight? Were they just your most salient memories or was there a narrative that you were trying to construct? Um, yeah, cause it's just like, I, I, I sense, you know, I know Velma, I know Phil, you know, uh, but of course I don't. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're just you. these key moments. Thank you, Joy. Um, that's a really good question. So all of the stories are based on memory. So that was how I chose them. But within there, I wasn't always privy to the entirety of what happened. So some I did have to make up. So for example, the conversation in Maddie's hospital room between father and mother is wholly fictional. Um, but I used what I knew that my father had told me and, and knowing his personality so well, I could become him in that moment and sort of play both of them. Um, and I think that that was a key, that is a key moment in the book because it's Phil confronting, you know, his mom about colorism and about not loving him and, you know, the kind of childhood um, he was exposed to because of of her lack of inability to to embrace him fully as a person. Um, but that convert, you know, I wasn't really, they weren't really in my in my room. And I, it, it was it was a, a wholly made up scene using everything that I knew, um, and then sort of pulling, pulling strings a little tighter, um, making up some things, you know, that I, I couldn't have known. Um, so did, did that answer the question? So that, that was one moment. Um, I, I, I don't know if I know none of the other ones come to mind, but if there is one in particular that you want me to talk about, I would, I'd be happy to, but that's the one that jumps out. Are you, you're good. <laughs> okay. Hi, Tony. Ann. Hey, Janina. <laughs> um, I guess the question is about you're co you're covering a lot of like very big themes, colorism, racism, parental relationships, mother daughter relationships, and I'm I'm curious to see or like to hear about like what you excavated below those things, like as a as a writer, as a person, like you did you take those things and try to dig a little bit deeper and try to understand why those things were significant to you and what other themes you discovered because I read your first, your other book uh -huh. and there's like similar things that are running through it and just wondering what you found below that maybe um or if you've dug deeper or if you're curious to find out why those things are important to you or why those themes reoccur mm -hmm. yeah well colorism I I sort of use throughout a, a little bit and so for me it was just being othered in in that environment for my dad, it was being othered in his own family because his father was a darker person and his mother was light and she felt that he would have the, an easier life. And so she favored the darker child. Th this is my dad's perspective. Um, so I did go a little deeper 
just sort of thinking about that, that family dynamic. Um, my dad had, my dad never actually mentioned colorism within the family. It was just something that I observed. And I knew that my dad's perspective was his brother and his mother were close and he was left out. And so that was something that I brought to it. Um, so that's a dip, you know, another aspect of colorism. And then my mom, um, I did not know in, in the course of this book, except for the last story that my mother was adopted. And, um, as far as I knew, as I was growing up, my mother's parents were, one was Jamaican and the other was Southern and they were both black. I found out at 18 that my mother's biological father was a Russian Jew, which was confirmed with DNA. I'm 25% Ashkenazi, but I didn't know that growing up. So when people would say like, why, you know, you're black, like, why do you look so loud? I'm, that's just how, that's just, I, they didn't tell me. So I just, I really didn't know. So I brought that in. So for for my mom, colorism was more about just that she wasn't wanted. She was given away. So neither her dark-skinned mother or her white father uh, could keep her or wanted to keep her. So that sort of brings in the light skin gone to waste theme. It's like it's sort of wound throughout. So it's there's an, an actual time in the book where there's a line that somebody says that to her. And that mean, that what the meaning of that was that she had this long hair and she cut it off so that she had an Afro so that everybody would know that she was black because she was tired of, of people like Tobias who like didn't know at first. And then when they found out that became a problem. Um, so her aunt says to her that she, you know, she's still light, but now her light skin's gone to waste. It's a horrible insult and you should never, never say that to anybody, but then using it thematically, it sort of brought in the colorism, but it also brought in the idea of, Here's this light-skinned couple who thinks that their proximity to whiteness is going to be this great thing. And of course, there are advantages to proximity to whiteness. However, it killed their marriage. And they were so busy pursuing all these financial benefits that there was nothing there. There was it was like hollow. Um, so that's that's what. I was trying to do sort of weaving all, all the ways in which light skin was gone to waste. Thank you. Patrick, thanks. Hi, Tony Ann. Hi. So um, thank you for giving me an advanced copy of the book. Thank you uh, for having me, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks for making this happen. Um, when I read the book, I was struck by, you know, this family had this facade, facade of perfection which probably in the 60s, many upwardly mobile Black American families did. Mm -hmm. And you could see chinks in the armor with the uh, Velma's a little bit more real. She will fly off handle <laughs> um, than Phil. Phil will try to keep it together. Mm -hmm. And that facade, do you think it's because they were conscious of being under the white gaze, they're the only Black family, or... Is it because they're trying to run away from the generational trauma that they're both escaping? So that's the first question. The second question is the daughter, Maddie, you almost felt like they never really saw her. It was, she was, they really only were concerned about her when it was a reflection on them. And they didn't understand what she was going through being in this environment. And they were kind of like, you should be so grateful to be here. Do you understand this opportunity? They were exactly like that. <laughs> okay. So I just would like you to talk about that, the facade, mm -hmm. and what was, what caused it? Was it, was it running from them or was it the white gaze? And okay. why do you think that, you know, they didn't see their daughter and perhaps your parents didn't see you? So I can only guess um, what caused the facade because we never talked about it, but I know that my mother had sort of a 1950s aesthetic and attitude. And so she wore the white gloves and the nice pumps and she never went out without makeup. And there were some working class to lower class white people in our community who would wear curlers to the grocery. And my mother just was appalled by that. Like she was just very genteel. And I, and I think that 
I think that a lot of black women of that generation were like that. And so there always was a facade because who, you know, who has a full face of makeup on every day? But my mother did. She got up and every day put on her face and she had her nice clothes and she wanted to be the wife of a professional person. And so she, you know, she was very pleased to be the wife of a doctor. Um, I don't, as far as the facade, I think my, from my dad's point of view, I think my dad so wanted validation from his white colleagues and peers. So most, he had some black psychologist friends, but a lot of them were not black. Um, and I, he really wanted their approval. And I think that that is, you know, that's part of it. Like he, you know, he skied in the in the winters. He went to Switzerland every winter with a with a white friend and he played tennis. He joined the tennis club. I think he wanted to give the appearance of being like a bon vivant. And maybe he was. I mean, my dad had a great life. He enjoyed his life, but it it was a kind of facade. It was sort of like like checking boxes, you know, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna, you know, so. I'm not sure though, if that wasn't just kind of the culture of 50s, 60s, people who came of age, like in that time, I'm not sure. As far as them not seeing Maddie, I think that that is just a product of narcissism. I think that when you're a narcissistic parent, your child is an extension of you. And so that's what they see. So when my dad was proud and pleased by me, it was often as a presentation to someone else, like so that he could brag to his friends. My, do my daughter, so I remember one time he really hurt my feelings. I hadn't, I hadn't worked as a screenwriter for a couple of years. And my dad introduced me as, this is my daughter. She used to write movies. Ugh. <laughs> so, but that was his thing. It was just like pre presenting, let me, and my sister, became a doctor and she was Ivy League educated. And I think that he just really valued that. It's like, look, look what I've produced. Um, my mom was, was even more narcissistic than my dad. And I think, I'm not sure that her facade came from trauma, but it was, that was genuinely her past that she never, she would not say that she was traumatized. My, my mother said she did not miss her biological mother, that she didn't think about her, that she didn't care. When I wanted to find her, my mother said, why? And I said, because she's my grandmother. And I was crying. And she said, what are you crying about? Like, she just couldn't, she just couldn't understand that her past was connected to my past and my present. It just, just didn't make sense to her. So yeah, I, I, I wish I knew for sure, like what led to the facade. I think I, I tried to bring in the trauma so that it would sort of not, not let them off the hook, but sort of explain why their behavior was the way that it was. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I wish I knew, I don't know if, if what actually created the, the whole presentation. I think it's probably a multitude of things. That's great. The, um, it touches on that answer, touches on a question we had from Zoom. Okay. Well, from a member of the Zoom audience. <laughs> Hello to the Zoom audience. They're in this box. Hello to um, <laughs> so this is from Lynn Sledge, who asks, are there benefits for the individuals or for you to model your characters after those you know? So I think, when is it useful to base characters on people you know? And when is it useful, I suppose, to invent them? Well, for this book, they were necessarily based on people I know because um, I was writing about my own experience and my family's experience. But it there is um, when I when I don't base them on people that I know, I think I sort of pull from people that I know and my imagination. So they're kind of a combination, or they might be inspired by somebody I knew, um, or they might be completely wholly invented. Um, but I, I like all of those options. So I, I like, you know, working with people that I, that I actually know and sort of making a literary version of those people. So for instance, my mother was very funny, but she wasn't quite as funny as she is in this book. 
So I had fun playing with her language. Um, and same with my cousin Susie. I just had a ball like inventing the cadence of her speech. It's just so fun to to speak it and and it was fun to write it. So I find ways to bring in my own invention even in when I'm working on a character that's based on a specific person. Um, but I think absent that, like if you don't, if you're not creating anything, it doesn't, it doesn't quite feel, it, it's just reportage. It's not, it's not actually literary fiction. So I feel like even any writer who writes about real people, even in memoir, there's still an element of invention and play and sort of heightening what existed, I think. And you mentioned Sherman and Lexi and Juno Diaz. Can you talk about possible other influences over the years? Strong sure. influences? Um, I've read everything that Jennifer Egan has ever written. I just, I love her voice. Um, I've read every book, every fiction book that James Baldwin has ever written. I love his voice and I, I just love his approach to narrative. Um, I love August Wilson and the musicality in his language. And I love Tennessee Williams for that same reason. I just, I just love how the monologues end up being like arias they're they're just beautiful um and and you can if you just click into the rhythm that he's written it's going to be good um and so that's both of those writers tennessee williams and august wilson but august wilson in particular because of those long speeches they're they're so musical and i just saw one of the plays just like a few days ago so that's fresh in my mind but it's like uh, it's like an in, in incantation almost it's like the the rhythm sort of takes you somewhere and it just like creates this magic and I can't say that I write like that but I love hearing it and seeing it and just listening to it it's just so exciting to me thank you mm -hmm. more questions yes we have last question um you you have just uh seem so comfortable talking about your parents and and how you use them and their lives uh in the short stories that you have written i have i've I'm, I'm comfortable asking you this question because of your comfort in discussing people's lives that are not your own i love reading memoirs autobiographies fiction that's based on uh, true characters how does a writer get comfortable talking about other people, their lives and their stories, particularly when you know they're going to be upset or furious or secrets may be revealed. Um, I read these kinds of books all the time and I often wonder wonder about that. I'd love to just know what you think. I how, how guess you feel. I got comfortable because it's my story. So I interacted with those people and they did and said and behaved in ways that they did they didn't they were comfortable they were comfortable hitting me they were comfortable emotionally abusing me they were comfortable psychologically abusing me and so this is what i do i'm a writer they knew i was a writer <laughs> um so and i can't you know i i wasn't comfortable knowing that everybody was going to read it um but I was comfortable owning my story and and telling what happened to me. But there are, you're right, there's an aspect of, of some of these characters where I'm talking about their story, but their story affected me. So my mom told me a story about the last time she saw her mother and her mother lost custody and she would come to the foster family's house and stand at the door. And according to my mother, she wasn't allowed to come inside, but I'm not sure if that's true or if it's that if it's that the foster family wouldn't allow her to come inside because she tried to take my mother once and, and lost her. So my mother ran away and, and the police brought her back to the foster family. But my mom said she would stand there and she would say, I just wanted to see you. And when my mom told me that story, you know, I was seeing, hearing my biological grandmother. And so even though that story is my mother's story and she feels like it should be just for her, 
it's my story too, because that is my relative. And the reason that my mother is the way she is was because of that trauma of the, the, of being abandoned in, from her point of view. So as an artist, I have to find my way to be able to, to tell those stories. And, and I am attracted to raw, vulnerable, painful things. And so I don't know what, what else I could do. So if I, if I didn't give myself permission to do that, then I would be limiting my work. And at my age, I'm, you know, not young, like, I have to do my work, because time is finite. I, I don't have, you know, forever to tell the story. So I have to get it out and, and finish while I can. Um, so I'm not sure if comfort is exactly it, but, but I definitely feel like I have to do it. 